Welcome to the Northfield Church of Christ online worship service. My name is Michael, and it's Sunday morning. Let's move right on into the announcements. Our sister's Tanya Murillo. Her father had a stroke, Jose, and he is still in the hospital, although I understand he's improving daily. Uh, he is still in the ICU because his vitals haven't stabilized yet. But uh, if you want to reach out to Tanya, I, I think that uh, that would do her well. And keep Jose in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, Williams, cousins, James and Peggy are asking for prayers. Elizabeth Estevez is continuing to ask for prayers. And Melita is still at home recovering from the coronavirus, although I understand she's very healthy. And thank goodness. Now, if you are aware, the governor of New Jersey has lifted the ban on social gatherings to 50 people or less including churches. Now, we're not exactly sure of the time frame that we're going to meet back here yet. We have to have a lot of the safety protocols installed and we also have to have the streaming services ready to go. Now, you probably received an email or a phone call this week asking for your comfort level and whatever it is, that's fine. Um, because as I mentioned a moment ago, we are going to stream these and we're going to stream the worship services live uh, so it'll take a little time to get the equipment in, set up, and ready to go. So we're probably looking at a two to three week time frame before we're even able to meet back here at the building. And we'll keep you updated on a weekly basis, if not more. Now, speaking of streaming, uh, it is going to be live. And if you can't make it here or you don't feel comfortable coming back here, you can still watch it on our YouTube channel. Uh, the only difference is it'll go up at 1030 in the morning. But it will stay there indefinitely. So if you're at work or you can't worship at that uh, particular hour, it'll be there uh, forever. So I think that's all the announcements I have. If you're new and viewing us for the first time, uh, hang in with us till after the worship service to the closing thoughts, and we have some suggestions and ideas and remarks for you to find out more about us. I want to thank you for being patient with us during these trying times, and we're trying as hard as we can to bring these worship services to you. I really look forward to the day when we can meet back here in the building together as one, and I'm sure that you do too. In the meantime, we're going to have a prayer to open our minds for the worship service. Thanks again. Good morning, church. As we prepare our minds for worship service, will you bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning on this first day of the week, dear kind Father. With my head humbly bowed, dear kind Father, just seeking refuge in you this morning, dear kind Father. Just asking that you just be with us as we go into this morning's worship service, dear kind Father. Father, as we sing songs of praise to you, dear kind Father. We know that war and destruction is inevitable, dear kind Father, but we know that your final victory is certain, dear kind Father. I just ask that you just be with us this morning as we lift up our voices to you and hear another portion of your word, dear kind Father. I ask these prayers in your son's name, Jesus Christ, and let the church say amen. Amen. We have a song or two before the Lord's Supper. I'm going to sing the first verse of uh, three songs. The first will be the Old Rugged Cross. Uh, then it will be a verse from Beneath the Cross of Jesus. 
and when I survey the wondrous cross. So we're going to sing the first verse of those three songs. And this is before the Lord's Supper. And in your hymn books, uh, the Old Rugged Cross is on page number 313. They came to the place of the skull. There they crucified him. And that's from Luke 23, 33 through 34. <clears throat> on a hill Thanks for the bread. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, dear kind Father, just giving thanks for this bread, dear kind Father, which represents your son's body, dear kind Father. I just pray that as we partake of it, dear kind Father, it will be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. I ask these prayers in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Let us say amen. Amen. Join me as we pray for the cup. Our God, Father in heaven, the greatest sacrifice that the world has ever seen has been your son to die on the cross to save us for our sins. And let the world never forget that, Father. Father, thank you as he died on the cross with a crown of thorns on his head and a spear in his side, all that we may be with you one day in the kingdom of heaven. Father, thank you. We offer this prayer humbly through Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You know, part of our assembly here on the first day of the week is to give our contribution, or to give our giving, or some people call it tithing. You know, to give back what God has allowed us to prosper with. And even in these difficult times, we still need to set aside for God, because of what He's done for us. You know, each one of us has our own situation, but let's remember from 2 Corinthians in the ninth chapter about what we sow is what we also reap. And not just of our material possessions, but more importantly, what do we give from our hearts? Do we give ourselves first to God, or do we just think about the material possessions that we have that we give them back? We need to think about these things that it's from our heart that we want to give back to God, because we love Him just as He has loved us. And as we give, let's give with that loving heart that God has allowed us to have uh, through his son. So as we go about our giving uh, today and this week, let's just remember these things uh, that we need to be praying for. Let's, let's bow in prayer. Dear God and Father, as we assemble here this morning, on this first day of the week, Father, just as you've allowed us to, to prosper in this world, some more than others, Father, let us remember as we give back, we give back as you have allowed us to prosper some physically more than others but lord first and foremost we need to give from our hearts father to give back the best of us to you to give back the first fruits that you've given to us in this life sometimes we need to dig deep down inside to really find out what those first fruits are from each one of us personally father so we can give the best back to you just as you showed us the example of what it is to give the best that you gave your son to live on this earth but more importantly, that he went upon a cross on the day in Calvary to give himself up for all mankind, to go through that agony of the death on the cross. And now that he's showed us the power of death through that resurrection, we know we have a chance to be with you, that inheritance that you've allowed us to obtain through our belief in you, Father. Just to be with us this day as we give back. We just pray that the funds will be used properly in a manner to further your work on this earth. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Our hymn before the scripture reading uh, will be from our hymn books, 791. The title is On Bended Knee. On Bended Knee says, For this reason I kneel before the Father from Ephesians 3. On bended knee I come, with a humble heart I come, bowing down before your holy throne, lifting holy hands to you as I pledge my love you in spirit, I worship you in truth, make my life a holy praise unto you. On bended knee I come, with a broken heart I come, bowing down before your holy 
as I look upon your face. Show your mercy and your grace. Change my life, O Holy Spirit. Make me fresh and ever new. Make my life a holy sacrifice to you. We will have a scripture reading after this song. I'll be reading from John chapter 17. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Good morning. I will be reading to you from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Chapter 14 For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace, and in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Good morning. This is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey, and I will be delivering the message this morning. Certainly, these have been rather trying times over the last few months. What with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, we've been quarantined, our lives have uh, changed uh, so radically. And uh, I guess in this world of confusion. Um, this has dominated um, our news so much, uh, we just didn't think there would be any other confusion that could dominate the news, but the untimely death of George Floyd um, kind of superseded that. There have been protests, um, and uh, justifiably so, for a tragic, tragic incident. You know, we we live in a time of confusion. Uh, people sometimes just don't understand one another, and sometimes we don't understand this quarantine that we're in. And so, what do we do to to avoid confusion? I've been doing a series of lessons on Jesus the way. And we found out that Jesus was the way to a better life and he was the way to forgiveness. And this morning, we are going to look at Jesus as the way out of confusion, the way out of religious confusion. You know, there are many, many people uh, who claim to follow Jesus who are either confused or even repelled by conflicting doctrines and practices by those professing to be Christians. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed this prayer that we find in John chapter 17 and verse 21. He said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word that they all may be, now get this, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, 
that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Do you get that? Do you get the thread? Because the thread here is what our lesson is all about this morning. The thread is that we all be one. And Jesus prayed for that. He prayed for it fervently. And the apostle Paul uh, was concerned about this same problem. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 to 13, he said, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but you be perfected and joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now, uh, the church of Corinth certainly had several problems, and this was another of them. And Paul goes on and says, uh, now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. And then, and then he puts it all in a nutshell. And he asks this rhetorical question. He asks, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He cuts through all of the red tape here and lets us know that unity is what's so very, very important. And so we know this, that the confusion in the religious world today does not come from God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 23, Paul writes this, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So, since God is not the author of confusion, what's the source? What's, what's the source of confusion? Well, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, Paul gives this whole laundry list of terrible, terrible sins. And he says, any of you who practice even one of these shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so even so, is it possible today for people to be just Christians and not be a contributor to division? And the answer is a resounding yes. And Jesus shows us he shows us the way out of religious confusion. So we come to part one of our lesson today. And notice by Jesus' own example in the religious, religious climate of his day, when Jesus came to earth, he came to earth in a Jewish world. And the people were living under the law of Moses, the law of God that was given to Moses. Now, in that law, and this is very, very important, in that law, God didn't make any provisions for divisions. Yet, huh, yet, there were sects or divisions of Judaism. By the time Jesus got to earth, there were Pharisees, the somewhat conservative folks, the Sadducees, the more moderate people of their day, the Essenes, the, isolation, the isolationists, the Herodians or the Zealots, the one who wanted political connections with uh, those that were in charge. This isn't what God wanted, but this is the world that Jesus was brought into. And you know what? It was assumed that all people of the day, all religious people of the day, would line up with one of these sects of Judaism. Now, let's ask ourselves the question. Jesus comes along. Which sect of Judaism did Jesus belong to? And the answer is a resounding none. Jesus was an Israelite. He lived by the law of Moses. 
not any particular sect of the law of Moses, but just by the law of Moses. And in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through, uh, through 20, Jesus says this, Do not think that I came to destroy the law. I didn't come to destroy it, but I came to fulfill it. For I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle by no means will pass from the law until it is fulfilled. And so as he goes down a little further, he says, For I say unto you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And what Jesus was saying, don't get into one of these sects. You're an Israelite. You're under the law of Moses. This is the law that you will abide by. In other words, he encouraged all to simply be what the law of Moses said they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be Israelites. Now, Jesus ushered in a new covenant through his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, if Jesus were on earth today, what religion would he be? Of what sect would he be? Well, if he was simply an Israelite, I would profess to you that Jesus would be simply a Christian today. And that was certainly what his disciples came to be called. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it says the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And, and so notice that word in there. The disciples were first called Christians. This was their calling, what they were called. We'll get to this in just a moment. And in the Greek, it, it suggests that it was a name given by God himself. Maybe the new name, Christian, the new name. In any case, Jesus said it perfectly clear, just what God intended under the law that they were not to be divided. And since the New Testament is the law of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21, disciples of Christ were to be called Christians. So should we. Not only should we be content with being called Christians, we should also, um, we should also be concerned with just being Christians. Nothing more, nothing less. Just Christians. But how can we be sure that we're simply Christians? How can we be sure that we are a member of Christ's church that he wants us to be? Well, it helps to see what the Bible says. When in doubt, go back to the word of God. Let's find out what the Bible says about this. And here is our next uh, uh, section of our lesson, and it is the Lord's church. Jesus promised that he would build his church. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, in the 18th verse, where Jesus uh, said, what do, who do men say that I am? And, and Peter, very boldly as Peter was, says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And then through this confession, Jesus said to him, and I also say that you are Peter, and upon this rock, that confession, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now notice, Jesus said, I will build my church, not my churches. Because remember, unity is what's important. I will build my church. Now again, I've told you over and over again, Mark Syme is not a Greek scholar, but I do know a couple of terms. The term church comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which means literally a called out group, 
a called out group, um, an assembly, if we would, a congregation, if we would. Therefore, Jesus was promising to create his own group of people who have been called. Now, how does this calling take place? Well, the Apostle Paul, I think, explains it to us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14 and says, to which he called you, get this, to which he called you by the gospel for obtaining the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. He called us by the gospel, by the good news. Now, if we trace the roots of the church, 50 days after the Passover, 50 days after Jesus was crucified, Peter preached what is generally considered to be the first gospel sermon. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 41, after he really laid into these people and said, this Christ is the one that you crucified, and he was the Messiah, and he was the Son of God. And the people were touched to their hearts, and they said, okay, what do we do now? And Peter very boldly spoke out, and he said, repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now he goes on to say, for the promise is to you and to your children and all those are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and he exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. And it says, and then all those that gladly received his words were baptized. They did what Peter said they were supposed to do. And it says 3,000 souls were added that day. 3,000 souls. Now notice, those that gladly responded in faith, in repentance, and baptism, it says, were added. Now here's the question, and you should ask it, I should ask it. To whom or by whom and to what were they added? We find the answer down a little further in chapter 2, verse 47. It says, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so that first day of Pentecost, following the Passover, when Jesus was crucified, was the beginning of the Lord's church, the ecclesia, the called out, the called out assembly. And for a little while, there was only one church. It was the church in Jerusalem. But all these people at Pentecost were there for the festival. And, and they, they were not all Jerusalemites. I don't know if there's such a word as Jerusalem. But they were not all residents of Jerusalem. And so they went back to their own cities, as we find out in Acts chapter 14, verses 21 to 23. It says they returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. And they strengthened the souls of the disciples and they you know, exhorted them to continue in the faith. And so by simply preaching the gospel of Christ, a local church was formed when those who obeyed the gospel joined together in their work and worship. And these local churches were independent. Here's their guidebook. Nobody wrote a guidebook. There weren't to be sects. There weren't to be divisions. There was one Bible, one gospel, one word. They were to be unified. And Christ directed them through inspired apostles as they taught them to worship and work together. Hmm. Sometimes this teaching was done directly by the apostles or sometimes by appointed emissaries. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul says to the Corinthians, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. 
So in this case, Paul sent Timothy to that church to bring the word to them. But most of the time, when Paul visited places and he maybe couldn't visit again, he wrote letters to them. The letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, were all letters written to churches. And these letters were Holy Spirit-inspired words to guide the church. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 37. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. He's saying, I've got the Holy Spirit inspired words. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, it says, These things I write to you, saying to Timothy, Though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And so he wrote a letter, he had sent Timothy, but now he wrote a letter to Timothy explaining how Timothy was to act. And so when we see what the Bible tells us about the Lord's church. We learn by responding to the gospel and paying close heed to the apostles' doctrine. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. People in the first century were able to be Christians only without the confusion that sometimes is prevalent today. And so now we ne ask the next logical question. If they were able to do that 2,000 years ago, is it possible for us to do it today? And again, the answer is a resounding yes. And so we get to the last part of our lesson, and that is avoiding division by following Jesus. First of all, we can begin by obeying the same instructions that Peter gave on the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, here's our beginning. Here's the wellspring. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so by repenting of our sins and being baptized for the remission of our sins, we would then receive the same blessings that these 3,000 people received 2,000 years ago in big, bold letters. Salvation. Being saved in this manner, we know that the Lord truly adds us to his church. Just as it said in Acts 2.47, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So, what then? Since the early Christians, who according to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, joined no other religious organization, neither should we. By being in Christ, we are automatically united with others who are in him as members of the Lord's church. Have you ever visited another church? Have you ever been on vacation and gone somewhere else? Jane and I were on vacation in Hawaii with our, our daughter Amy and our son-in-law Freddie. We worship at the Pearl Harbor Church of Christ. Other than the clothes that they were wearing, they did all the same things that we did. In 2018, we went to Minneapolis and we worship at the Richfield Church of Christ on that Sunday. <laughs> Everything they did was pretty much the same that we did at the Northfield Church of Christ. Why? Because we are united. We are trying to do it the way the Lord has set down for us to do it. As members of the Lord's church, we need never to stop searching the scriptures. 
We need to study carefully the New Testament and the description of the church. And this description is found in the book of Acts. It's found in the epistles. And we're supposed to follow it. And it is here that we find instruction from the Lord's apostles. How? One, how to worship the Lord acceptably. How? How to be scripturally organized as a local congregation. How? To live and work together as Christians, spreading the gospel through the word. An example. Since the apostles were guided by the Holy Spirit in their writing, we can be sure that their instructions were exactly what Jesus wanted those instructions to be. And it is possible, I believe, for us to duplicate the instructions of the early church if we simply say, I am a Christian. And we can be certain that the Lord will be pleased with us. Now, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 16, Jesus said this to his then disciples. He said, He who hears you Here's me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Wow. Those are strong and powerful words. Jesus has always simply wanted us to be Christians. And by following the examples of Jesus and the Holy Spirit-inspired apostles, we can be led out of religious confusion. To do this, we have the responsibility to learn and follow the apostles' doctrine. It's not enough to be baptized and say, okay, I'm saved. The Lord tells us that we need to be true and faithful right up to the end. We need to continue to grow in the Lord and grow in the Lord's word. And we have to follow the apostles' doctrine and serve the Lord in our lives. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. This is what we are to do. If you've come to this point in your life, and you have hearkened back, and and you listened to what Peter said on that day of Pentecost, when he told them to repent and be baptized through the mission of your sins, If you've come to that and you realize that this is what you need to do, we're always here to assist you. You have but to contact one of us and we will take care of that need. Be sure, if necessary, to confess your sins one to another. Confess those sins to the Lord and let him know that you want forgiveness of those sins. I pray that all of you will be safe. I pray that before too long, we will be able to gather together uh, at our uh, church building at 2535 Shore Road. Until that time, I pray that you watch our services here on YouTube, and I pray that you be healthy and that you uh, be safe and that you look at the things that are going on in the world and realize that Jesus is the answer to any confusion that exists in the world. Thank you so much, and may God bless you richly. Our closing hymn this morning will be from our hymn books number 792, My Eyes Are Dry, 792, and from the reading from Psalm 25, it says, Guide me in your truth and teach me. My eyes are dry. My eyes are dry, my faith is old, my heart is
his heart. My prayers are cold and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be done to an old heart like mine? Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. As we close out our worship service this morning, will you bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning just giving thanks for this first day of the week, dear kind Father, in which we assemble together to worship you in spirit and in truth, dear kind Father. I pray that everything that was said and done was pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, dear kind Father. I just pray that as we go out through the rest of this week, dear kind Father, that we will be joyful, dear kind Father. Pray continually, dear kind Father, and just give thanks in all circumstances, dear kind Father, for we know this is your will for us and your son Jesus Christ, dear kind Father. I just ask that you just be with our, our, our members, dear kind Father. I just ask that you just be with the world as a whole, dear kind Father. Just be with those that are sick and those that are shut in, dear kind Father, and those that have lost loved ones, dear kind Father. Just keep us safe until the next time that we assemble together to worship you in spirit and in truth. I ask these prayers in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Welcome back. And what a great lesson series this is, and we hope that you remain with us through the finale of these great sermons. Now, if you're new and this is your first time watching us and you want to find out more about us, we have a website, www.northfieldchurchofchrist.com, where there's lots of information there. There's also a phone number if you want to reach out to us personally. Also, if you want to receive a daily devotional, we have a great Facebook page at facebookpage.com forward slash Northfield Church of Christ. Also, don't forget our online contribution platforms. We have PayPal and we have Venmo. And of course, you can always send your check into the building or lay by in store, whatever's comfortable for you. And if you haven't yet already, there's a little red square over here. It's a subscribe button. If you could hit that for us and subscribe to our channel, it really helps us out a lot. Well, that's it today. We hope you enjoyed the lesson. Thank you for being here. We look forward to seeing you next week. Have a safe week. Bye-bye. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves today.